Hello, everybody. I am Becca Schuler with Cascade Academy, our clinical director at Adolescent Treatment for Girls with Anxiety and OCD. And I'm here with Spencer um, and Stacy. And thanks for joining us. And we're excited to introduce you to some great information they have to share with us today. Spencer, introduce yeah, yourself. Yeah, thank you. Good to be back. And I really enjoyed the last time we did one of these videos and had these discussions. And, and today I'm excited to go even more in depth into uh, human physiology, brain anatomy and processes uh, involved in, in trauma. Um, we'll talk a lot about trauma today, but, but know that everything we talk about it has some relevance to anxiety too, um, and other mental health disorders. So many of the networks in the brain share so much overlap um, that there's some utility in here for all of them. And, and we can talk about that as we go along. Feel free, Stacy and, and Becca, like last time to to ask questions and we'll have some good discussion as we go along. Um, and this is just a reminder from last time, people who are watching this video remember this from the last video, but we've got the three different levels of the brain, right? The reptilian brain, the mammalian brain, the neomammalian brain. Um, this slide may be updated a little bit from the last one we saw, but um, you know, the neocortex is, is where we as human beings practice empathy and, and make empath have empathy and make connection. Um, engage in choice or the experience of choice and creativity. It's where we predict future outcomes, evaluation, language, abstract thought. Our limbic system, our mammalian brain is where we um, assign value to things, which creates feelings, which allows us to be caregiving creatures and animals. And, um, and then our reptilian brain is our brain that's about survival and keeps us alive in the next 10 to 15 seconds. Uh, it's managing our energy levels and our heartbeat and, our, and all of that stuff and taking in sensory recognition and helping us do what we need to do moment to moment to stay alive. So um, we talked about last week how a breakdown in those relationships between, between those three parts of the brain and their functioning is a, is a big part of where we will get post-traumatic stress or anxiety or even depression um, and some research I've done, even substance use, right? So um, this slide is, is, is a little new from last time. I'm gonna go a little bit more into depth. I, I remember talking about the grizzly bear and it passes it up to the amygdala and passes it up to the, the CEO. And when that's all working great, we have top down control, but something gets broken in there, right? Um, this will go a little bit more in depth and into the anatomy of the brain and just how all of that works and what's really going on. So we have our, our senses, right? Um, taste is one of them, but, but here in the case of tr trauma, I guess you could taste something traumatic, but usually it's something you see, hear, feel, uh, smell, but any, all of our senses in the outside world come up through our brainstem and go right to this part of the brain right here, this, orange one on the left and this orange one on the right are called our, our right and left thalamus. And all the information that, that comes in goes to that as a hub and the thalamus is gonna root it to other places of the brain um, for us to perceive what's going on and assess our safety and what to make of that information. This is part of the assigning value phase of, of experiences that we're having and, and things that we're coming across. The thalamus, reroutes that information and most quickly sends it down to the amygdala. These yellow little structures here are the amygdala. A lot of people think um, we only have one amygdala because people talk about it in a singular form. But in the brain, we actually have two amygdalae. Um, we have a right and a left. In fact, most structures in the brain are symmetrical and we have a right and a left. Um, and within, last time I told you within 33 milliseconds, our amygdala is making decisions about, oh, am I in, in danger here, right? Is this a threat to me? That's true. And this is what some researchers call the low road of brain communication. It happens super, super fast, lightning quick and under the level of consciousness, right? Um, so the amygdala then, um, Bessel van der Kolk in his book, The Body Keeps the Score, he calls it the smoke detector. It's just trying, if it smells any smoke, any danger, it's going to sound the alarm um, and it's going to happen quickly. And that's where I said your amygdala screamed and you didn't even know it, right? 
Well, the amygdala works quickly back and forth with the hippocampus, this purple seahorse looking structure right next to it. And we have a right and a left. And the hippocampus, for those who you know, have gotten a little bit into neuroanatomy and neurostructures, is where we know what memory is heavily involved. And so our amygdala, our fear center, center of the brain, our smoke detector is talking to our memory center back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and trying to determine is this experience we're in right now, are these sensations I'm getting, is my environment related to any past information that can help me know if this is an okay situation or a bad situation, if that makes sense. And then they'll pass their feedback uh, here to the hypothalamus. There's only one hypothalamus in the brain, right there in the middle, the green structure. And if they've determined that, that there's a threat here, um, the hypothalamus will start along with the pituitary glands sending information about uh, we're in danger down to the rest of the brain stem and down. It'll actually go all the way down to your gut, to your adrenal glands, so you can pr produce cortisol, adrenaline, and that's what enters you into the fight or flight response, right? So this is how the brain functions to say, we're in danger, bad scenario. We need to, we need to have some anxiety here. We need to have some adrenaline. We need to, to, to figure this out. Um, and if that process plays all the way through, then we have bottom up reptilian brain control, which takes over to get us through the moment and help us survive it. Okay. That's the low road. The high road is while the thalamus sends that information down to the amygdala, the thalamus also sends that information up to the medial prefrontal cortex or the CEO of the brain. And the thalamus, um, when it passes it there, this is called the high road. It takes longer. It doesn't happen in 33 milliseconds and we experience it consciously. This is where we get conscious processing. And while the amygdala is working with the hippocampus on a lower level to decide, am I in danger here? And then maybe start the fight or flight response. There's further evaluation going on in the prefrontal cortex here in the medial region. And then depending on that evaluation, oh, and, and uh, Bessel van der Kolk, I like his metaphors because they help me understand it. He calls this higher road, the watchtower, the medial prefrontal cortex, not the smoke detector. So the smoke detector is really quicking up picking up quickly. Hey, I, I think there might be some smoke here. Danger, 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 alarm, alarm, alarm. Um, well, the watchtower is looking down on the smoke from a higher view going, oh, that's just uh, your eggs burning on the stove. It's not your house burning down, right? And passes that feedback down to the amygdala, which has already started its processing and got that going. And so if that happens, then, then the medial prefrontal cortex can say to the amygdala, we're just fine here. The smoke you're smelling isn't dangerous or it's coming from, it's just a picture or, or whatever it was that we talked about last week. And it can stop that process of going into the fight or flight sympathetic nervous system response from happening. Are you with me so far on that? So a little bit more detail, a little bit more, but I think it's kind of fun to, to see the structures in the brain and kind of how they work. Can I ask a question though? So at this point, just because of the speed though, the amygdala has already communicated with the hippocampus. So there's already been some sort of an activation before the watchtower can send back the signal because that operates so much faster. Yes. Yeah. And if you think about it, I remember once when I was living in Texas running on a, a running trail and I was going for my, my run and I remember seeing something out of the corner of my eye on the ground. And I, I didn't even know what it was, but I jumped, I jumped off the path and I started having a fight or flight response. I started breathing heavy, heavier than I was just because I was running. And when I did a double take and looked back, I noticed that it was just a stick, but my body, my subconscious thought for a moment, maybe it was a snake. Right. And, but my, it, yes, I started the fight or flight response, but in process, it got interrupted by feedback from the prefrontal cortex, from the watchtower that said, okay, you're okay. Oh, we're, that's not what it is. And, and it all resolved pretty quickly. And I was back on the trail running like nothing had happened. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the information that the watchtower sends back down can resolve 
that process rather quickly if that's all working properly. Yes, yeah, so once it gets involved, it, it can it can take charge and, and smooth things out really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but that's why I told you, some of you even screamed when you saw the grizzly bear, it just all happened so quickly, you didn't even notice it. Um, so that's the watchtower. And so ultimately, you know, there's a relationship between the watchtower and the smoke detector um, that's working well and a communication going between them, this higher level brain and the lower brain, the higher human thinking cognitive brain and the lower emotional brain or brains. Um, and we know that in trauma, that gets broken, that relationship. The, the watchtower gets knocked out. Get, its communications get log jammed. Um, it can't give its feedback. And, um, say, and then that results also in anxiety and fear and, and, and this, the, that other process of getting the fight or flight system, system going. And, and Becky, you had, before we started this presentation, you had made a comment about um, is, you know, what is trauma? What leads to trauma? How come it happens? And maybe, maybe you can rephrase that here because I think this is related to it. Yeah, I think one thing that is important for people to know, especially the families that that we all work with is sometimes things don't just seem like big T or capital T traumas like this assault or this car accident or this natural disaster, but not being able to resolve something in this process and not being able to also have a physical response to some sort of a stressor that that gets logged in the brain as something that's traumatic or, or unresolved and contributes to, I like the analogy you use, the, the log jam. So, you know, sometimes I, I work with people who say, you know, we had, we, we have a generally healthy family. Sure, we have things that we need to improve on, but my, my child was maybe, for example, like never assaulted or never abused. Why are there still like these things that are trauma responses, like the brain's traumatized um, without, uh, without the presence of these really obvious traumas that they get stored in the brain differently um, if they're not able to resolve physically, mentally, emotionally. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Stacy, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, and I think that right there, how it's not able to flow through, um, it, that's where the lack of integration occurs is, is that it's, it's, not able, it's not able to really, it's not able to, it's like there's the stopping point and then in that stopping point, just like a river, you know, I think I often kind of, I kind of see um, anxiety and the stress response very much like a, a river. And when they, you get these big logs that jam, you know, they, they start kind of jamming up the flow. And um, so sometimes things get, they get backed up, not because the flow is off, but because there's jams. And so a lot of, you know, kind of working through this, working through trauma reprocessing has to do with taking out some of those big jams that have happened because they weren't able to flow all the way through and get integrated. Mm -hmm. and, and then as they, as they're able to kind of flow through, then people can manage the level of stress that before was unmanageable. Mm -hmm. And so it's very much about, um, you know, there's so many metaphors, I think, between trauma and nature, but, but one of them is just how, it, how essential it is that stress flows through and that, you know, just like water needs to flow through in order for things to be able to be healthy, just like water needs to be healthy. So, mm -hmm. so I think just that piece there where, you know, it's not able to fall through, then, then there's like this endpoint that doesn't fully get integrated, then that endpoint becomes its own identified stressor mm -hmm. that becomes a trigger. And then the next, it just, it just kind of keeps it keeps getting re-traumatized uh, because of, of the window of reconsolidation and some other things that, that I'll talk about too um, in just a moment. Yeah, thank you. And I, I would add that, um, so I think a takeaway from this discussion is <laughs> trauma is different for everybody. What, what is considered traumatic is person specific. I would argue that family members in my research that I've worked with who have gone through uh, supporting a loved one through a mental illness or through an addiction or substance use disorder, for them, that experience can be traumatic um, and, and overwhelm their brains and their brain systems and networks from processing it and getting through it and resolving it. And, and it becomes stuck as Stacy's talk about. And I'll talk a little bit more about the body here next and the fight or flight response. And I think that'll continue to help answer, how does this happen? You know, how does trauma occur for somebody? Um, 
it's important that we kind of talk for a minute because uh, later in our discussion today, we're going to dive into talking about bilateral activation, right? That's a huge piece here in the recovery from trauma. And so we need to talk about why both sides of the brain are important. We know that the right side of the brain is involved in uh, memories, memories of sound, touch, smell, so our senses, but also memories of emotion. Um, that's what most of the research has pointed to, that our right side of our brain is more of our emotional brain. And then it also is involved in the processing of voices and, and facial features and gestures. While the left side of our brain is more logical in nature and more detail oriented and engages more in future planning and linear processing. And um, van der Kolk in his book talks about how when we experience trauma, oftentimes uh, it's the right side of the brain that we rely on to try and get through it. Um, because the right side of the brain processes emotions and it's trying to figure out, you know, smell and touch and, and sound. And it's working with memory to figure out what we should store and what we should remember. And the left side kind of goes offline, which is unfortunate because the left side would be able to help us figure out what caused this. How did we get to this point? Um, what happened here and, and help me linearly process it and plan to avoid it in the future. But, but in the moment of survival, we're not, we're not doing that, right? We're just surviving. Um, and so the right side of the brain becomes really important. And I think I showed this last time too, maybe. Um, so just a very brief review here, but the right side of the brain is also the side of our brain that tells us about danger and that maybe we should avoid something and it's super risky. While the left side is telling us maybe it's okay and, and there might even be benefit in it. Maybe we should approach it and embrace it. And so again, if the right side is overactive or, or relied on in trauma, as it probably should be in a traumatic situation, but if it remains that way, then we see the world through that view of, of a fear-based lens and worried that something bad is going to happen or could happen and how do we avoid that? Um, and so again, we want, we want a healthy brain to integrate activity between the left and the right hemispheres where they can talk to each other, give information about the situation to each other. And so the decisions can be made that are, that feel like actual choices and actual decisions rather than compulsions or reactions or whatever they might be. Um, and this comes from actually Van der Kolk's study um, that he talks about in his book um, where he, he shows pictures of a, a person in a fMRI and in, in a scanner um, and they're, they're hel helping I shouldn't use the word helping, but they're having this person relive their trauma while they're in the scanner. And, and he points out that we see three things, this huge right side activation down in the limbic system. Um, so fear-based center of the brain, avoid center of the brain, and very connected with an emotional response. And he points out that we see uh, activation start going on in the visual cortex, even though they're not in the situation again, they're reliving it in their memory and in their mind their parts of the brain are activating that indicate they're seeing it again, right? They're actually visually having an experience here while they're having all the pain and fear with it. And the left side of their brain, this is actually diminished activation in Broca's area and language area and linear thinking areas. And so you're not really thinking, you're having an emotional experience as you witness it again, and you're not really processing your way through it. You're just going through the hell of reliving it. Does that make sense? So the brain has been fragmented or disconfigured uh, in trauma. And, and there, again, there's some truth to this as well, just in anxiety and other related disorders. Well, and this reminds me so much of why, why there's so much attention as there should be and development in experiential interventions that we don't just verbalize, right? And that it's not just the language, but how do we bring intervention and healing to all different areas of our brain um, instead of just the verbal processing because we see it's being experienced in all areas of the brain. Yes, absolutely. Well, and, and one thing I just wanted to throw out there is, is part of the reason why being able to utilize the other senses when you're in a moment of re-traumatizing is so essential is because your visual cortex 
Mm. your vision you, you you're experiencing things that you are imagining they've actually shown this is kind of an example of this that the same neurons within your visual cortex fire whether or not you are simply imagining something or if it's just really happening and so i mean it might as well just be happening in terms of what's really going on for the brain the visual piece and that's part of why using your body is so essential because vision is one of the senses but it's only one so mm -hmm. it's kind of like we have to utilize our other senses to help us off balance the intensity of the visual piece that can often come. Mm. Yeah, great points, great points. So let's talk about the body, that's the brain, right? Let's move in and talk about the body a little bit. Remember the hypothalamus sends a message down to start the fight or flight response with the sympathetic nervous system. A lot of this work and what I'm about to discuss comes from Stephen Porges and his work with polyvagal theory where he's kind of talking about the, the role of the vagus nerve and connecting the brain to the body and, and, um, and the fight or flight response. So um, the vagus nerve is, is one of the biggest nerves in the body and it runs kind of from the base of the brain down to the end of the bottom of the spine. And there's a front portion to it called the ventral vagus nerve. Ventral means front, for, forward, and dorsal means back or on top. And so you got this, part of the, the vagus nerve running on the back side as well. And um, the vagus nerve is actually a very critical nerve in the parasympathetic nervous system. So we better explain just really quickly the difference between the sympathetic nervous system and the, uh, the, the parasympathetic nervous system. This, the sympathetic nervous system um, activates when we are in danger. When our brain is, our amygdalas work with the hippocampus and set that alarm to the hypothalamus and it comes down saying, okay, this is real, we're in danger. Fire alarm, it's a real fire. Um, then it, the sympathetic nervous system activates kind of increased breathing, faster heart rate, shutting everything down that doesn't need to be active so that we can survive the situation. We can either fight it or run away from it. Well, the parasympathetic nervous system is the opposite of that. It brings everything back to a, uh, a rest and the digest state, they call it, uh, you know, where you're, you slow your heart back down and you calm down and you, and you slow your breathing down and you realize you're not in danger anymore. And it's okay to relax and to sleep or to play, but you're safe. Um, so uh, the metaphor I use to explain how this works between the, the ventral and the dorsolateral vagus nerve, which activate the parasympathetic nervous system to calm you down versus the sympathetic nervous system and the, and the nerves associated with that that fire you up to survive the situation is actually that of a car. I, I have to give my students credit in one of my classes for this because they came up with it and then we further talked about it. And I thought this helps people understand it a little bit. But if you're moving through life and your body is the car, if you have your foot on the brake, um, you know, and especially these days, automatic cars kind of automatically roll forward unless you're holding the brake down. But the user has control of when to push the brake and make things stop and when to pull it up and you can kind of keep moving forward. Um, in moments of danger though, our body wants to push the gas pedal and really speed up our systems, especially those that will help us fight or flee the situation to either resolve the danger or get away from the danger. And so that's, um, if we slam on the gas, um, that's kind of the, the metaphor there for activating the sympathetic nervous system to really fire us up and get us a, full of adrenaline and moving. Um, the brake is the ventral vagus nerve in front, right? Kind of in front toward the, uh, toward the neck. Um, and it kind of is controlling that break, like stopping and going the parasympathetic service, sympathetic nervous system as needed. Um, the brake will release if we push the gas so that the car will go faster and we can get away and then we can push the brake again. And in most, most of the time, you know, that's a nice dynamic of brake and gas so that we can navigate and get where we want to get. Well, then what is the emergency brake? The emergency brake is metaphorically related to the dorsal side of the vagus nerve. And this is perhaps the most important piece to our discussion today. The dorsal vagus nerve, when it senses not just danger, but life threat, and our defensive strategies of running away or fighting it don't work or don't seem like they will work, then the emergency brake gets applied. 
And that means no matter whether we're pushing the brake, the ventral vagus nerve, or the gas, the sympathetic nervous system, we're not going anywhere. It is shutting us down. And this is the freeze state, right? So fight or flight are danger. But when neither of those work, the body goes into freeze. And that creates immobilization. I'm not going to get away from this grizzly bear. It'll catch me. And I'm also not going to be able to fight it. Or I'm just so overwhelmed, I can't even process either of those things. I'm going to lay here and be dead. Um, we enter this state of immobilization. We're the turtle, as some of these uh, neurological researchers talk about it, who enters our shell instead of trying the other active methods of dealing with it. I wonder um, if, if you could give some examples of just sort of like behaviorally, if someone's observing someone in their life or in a state of stress or crisis, what would look different about their behavior between the fight flight and the freeze moment? And, and I bring that up too, especially with working with, with adolescents, but everybody, um, this is not, you know, age, age dependent, but I feel like there's this moment sometimes where uh, people are un they understanding that this person's not registering any of the words that are happening, <laughs> right? Like you could say, I'll give you a million dollars if that, if you think that that would solve their problem and it doesn't register and they are just still so yeah. overwhelmed, so overloaded that it's almost like the reality around is not existing because it's not registering. So I can think of examples with clients. Uh, I'm gonna give you an example from high school that just popped in my mind. I was, my best friend in high school had an intense fear of public speaking. And, and I won't you know, go into more than why that was there or whatever, but it was there. And I walked out, I was walking down the hallway one time and he was standing there, like kind of tapping and just kind of sitting there by his locker. And I said, why aren't you supposed to be in class? You even told me you're presenting today. And he said, um, I, I, he couldn't really talk much, first of all. And I was like, hey, seriously, what's going on? And, and all he could really get out was, I can't do this. I can't do this, right? He didn't run away from the situation. He didn't get in his car and drive home and be like, I'm just avoiding that altogether. And he didn't go in the classroom all agitated and anxious and really try to plow his way through it. He froze. He kind of just sat there and did nothing um, and, to, and just kind of stayed there. That's kind of a, maybe a silly example from my high school days where I first came across it. But do either of you, and I can give more with clients, but do any of you have examples of clients where you saw fight or flight behaviors versus this complete shutdown and mobilization? Well, you know, one thing I've actually found is it can be really hard to see the difference. People get really good at faking it, really, really good at faking it. You know, I mean, internally, we know when, when we're getting to that place, like we can, we can feel that break start to be pulled up. And it's like, I can't, you know, I can't speak. I, I, I really hope someone does not ask me a question right now because I will have no answer whatsoever. Um, but someone looking at that person might not even be able to tell. And so I think in particular, if people have a tendency to kind of be on the outskirts and to not be, you know, like they don't really ask questions anyway. They don't, you know, they're not really involved in the conversation. So especially with like social anxiety, honestly, I think a lot of people who deal with social anxiety this is, is, is a big part of what's going on for a couple of things. But, but one is that looking at them, you, you, you might not even be able to see it. And, and that's why it's so important for people to be able to, um, and, and then sometimes also um, it can happen very quickly. You know, it can happen just like in, in, in a few split seconds, you go from being able to process things well to suddenly I just can't. And then that fuels the anxiety. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, well, how do I know the next time I'm in a class that I'm not just going to get frozen like that? Mm -hmm. um, and so honestly, I think sometimes it's very apparent. Sometimes, sometimes it's not. And I, I would actually say that the, the real shutdown is almost harder to detect than just the sympathetic nervous system. Because usually in the, when, when, when the sympathetic nervous system is going, there's more body movement. That's the importance of body movement. When you are in dorsal vagus nerve, like when it's that break is pulled, you're not moving. And because you're not, you're just like a sitting duck and everything is just getting really, really, really ingrained in deep to a place where it just kind of, it's like a really big log is getting pulled into that, that river where things, just, it's like a very big stop gap. I, I guess. Yeah. Could, and much greater dissociation, I believe, uh -huh. um, in that deeper shutdown than when you're running for fight or flight 
um, you know, I think there's less dissociation to what's really going on in the situation. Yeah. Right. And, and because you're not moving your body, you know, the, the other parts of the brain can't really get back online to help you through the moment. Yeah. yeah. And, and it really has an impact in terms of, um, people being able to trust their gut intuition. I think a lot of people who struggle with anxiety also have difficulty with trusting their gut intuition because their sense of anxiety and, and, and that sense of threat can easily pivot from just a basic fight or flight response to a total shutdown. And, and when, you, when you look back on a situation, you're like, well, I don't really think I needed to shut down, but I also couldn't control it happening. Mm -hmm. It has an impact in people's ability to really uh, trust that gut intuition of like, okay, what is dangerous? What is not dangerous? And I've found in the trauma work I've done with my clients that that, that ability to access that gut intuition is so essential because in, in, in essence, it's really engaging that watchtower. So anyway, it's interesting how, how integrated it really all is and how quickly it can all shut down. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're, you know, our whole focus, our whole emphasis is just how do we get it back online? You know, when that, when that break has just been pulled and, and no one even maybe around them knows it and they don't know how to get out of it, how do we get people, how do we get stuff moving again? Mm -hmm. That's a, a huge part of helping people heal with trauma. Yeah, and some, some uh, neuroscientists and, and neuropsychologists talk about this as kind of a, a hierarchical thing almost where, you know, go back to our question of what is trauma for one person and why is it not that for another person? Well, it's, it's usually you're going to move to the sympathetic nervous system first into fight or flight, and that might resolve your situation. Mm -hmm. And whatever it is that leads the brain or someone or a body to realize that it needs to go to full shutdown and pull the emergency brake so you're not manually breaking or pushing the gas, um, what, whatever that is, I think at that point, that thing becomes even more traumatic to them. Yep. Right. Because that's when they're overwhelmed and there is no solution here. Yeah. There is no resolution other than complete shutdown. Yeah. Yeah. I want to add one thing. So we do one of our methods of therapy is exposure response prevention, particularly for OCD. And, you know, I heard people, uh, you know, talk about this a lot, but exposures uh, that somebody's not ready for or prepared for or that go too fast, too far, just turn into trauma. <laughs> and this is the perfect diagram of yeah. it's okay to have some arousal and some distress, but if it moves into the, the shutdown, then that has accidentally re-traumatized the system. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're crossing a line there, right? And that's what this, this graph here shows. You know, we're, we're in this place of adaptive self-regulation and we can apply the brake as much as we need to manually to stop and go and navigate our life. But then when we get into a really stressful or traumatic situation, we first usually enter into hyper arousal. And up here is the gas pedal, right? That's where this zone is. And something happens there. Maybe it'll resolve our situation. We'll go back to adaptive self-regulation. And maybe it was a, a small T trauma instead of a big T trauma. But um, often not, depending on the nature of the situation and the trauma and the overwhelmed physiology of the nervous system, <clears throat> we jump down into that shutdown, that emergency break, that hyper arousal. And now we've been traumatized and now we're locked up and now we're immobilized. And the hard part about trauma treatment is to come out of hypo arousal, you actually usually first pass through hyper arousal. When you release the emergency break, something is still pressing the gas pedal. You weren't going anywhere because the emergency break, but the gas pedal still pedal to the metal, right? So when people try to do exposure therapy or kind of, you know, face their fears or, you know, get into therapy and address this head on, one of the first things they feel when they come out of this hypo arousal shutdown and this immobilization is this intense feeling of fear and terror or anger or whatever it is, this fight or flight feelings. And then they run right back to the turtle shell, right? Like if you, if your exposure was too much, they go right back into the, the immobilization and they go through this pattern, you know, back and forth when really what they're trying to get back to is that, that sweet green tea colored adaptive self-regulation zone. Right. Um, and so over time, as we work with people as clinicians and mental health people working through trauma or, or intense, intense anxiety, we start to see that smooth out a little bit, right? Maybe we get into the hyper arousal a little bit and then scares us. So we jump back into the hypo arousal, but then we come back up in the self-regulation and it's a practice of, of dealing with our bodies and our emotions and our, and our sensations. 
Um, and ultimately we would get it back to looking to something like this, right? Um, in that zone. And so again, I think this help explains uh, what's traumatic for some people. Now real quick, so I can get turn the time over to Stacy to talk a little bit about more of her stuff. W were there any questions about any of that or comments? Well, we on. one thing I was going to just throw out there is I, I think part of the reason too why I mean so that that jumping back and forth from the hypo to the hyper is all I mean just indicative of that something it's not regulated yet you know and I think part of the reason why that's difficult is we often try to use our thoughts to get us into the window of you know of of, of window of tolerance but the reality is that we just saw like with that brain scan you know being able to to use thought being able to use that part of the brain is very limited. And that's, that's a really good example of the role that the body plays and being able to calm it down because you might not be able to come up with a, lot, a thought that you can trust, a thought that you feel like, yeah, I, I really feel like that's a safe place. But if you can get your body to feel safe, then, then that back and forth and back and forth can kind of, it can kind of uh, soften and de-intensify as things stabilize. And so um, Honestly, I think that's part of the reason why it, it jumps back and forth so quickly is because it's it's hard. It, people don't often realize the role that the body plays in being able to, to soften all of this and regulate it. Yeah, I mean, that's great, Stacey. And this is a fabricated example, right? But the person in their turtle shell in immobilization with the emergency brake off, on, they pull the emergency brake off. Everyone else is going, hey, guess what? The person who mugged you isn't here anymore, right? Their body doesn't know that their sympathetic nervous system doesn't even know that. Their gas has still been pushed down. They just had a break on that wouldn't let it happen. Um, you know, some, some kind of a survival piece there, but that's a great point. So let's talk about the body. Um, we used to think of the body just as organs and structures and um, didn't have their own consciousness. They were just there to, to perform a function for the body. And it was in the brain where we had consciousness and intelligence and and, and all of that. And so the brain could impact and control the body, but not the other way around. Well, we know now from research, and they call this term interoception, um, is that the body and its organs also have sensory receptors. Many of the organs even have their own brain cells, like the heart has neuron cells uh, attached to it, and so does the stomach. And so we know more and more now that the body has its own consciousness, and its own intelligence. And that's important because it tells us that not only do we experience a trauma and we go through that reptilian brain, mammalian brain, human brain process, and then we result in a trauma and we start the fight or flight and we shut down and go to mobilization, but that the body can be used to communicate something back to the brain, which I think Stacy was just alluding to, um, to help change the brain and restructure the brain and send needed messages. Um, Peter Levine is a trauma therapist and, and he, he has this quote, he says, you know, I found that teaching my clients how to relax certain muscles in their neck, jaw and shoulders often brought their blood pressure. And this was in the, in the context of like activating the trauma and going to that hyper arousal, uh, lowered their blood pressure to a normal level, sometimes in a matter of 20 minutes. Um, and so this is just one pioneer of how do we use the body and movement to help resolve trauma? Um, because without this knowledge, um, you know, you know, our, our, our organs, our heart, our, our guts, our brain, they're all communicated to also through a nerves in the spine called the, the pneumogastric nerve. Um, and that's why when we go through something really heart wrenching or gut wrenching trauma, uh, it feels like gut wrenching. It feels like heartache or heartbreak because the brain's communicating down to the vagus nerve or not at the vagus nerve, but the sympathetic nervous system, and then the vagus nerve is shutting down and we still have the gas going and, and we just feel awful, terrifying. Um, and most people wanna make that go away, that pain or that stress through compulsive reactive behaviors. Maybe you'll see OCD type behaviors, maybe uh, anxious based behaviors, maybe drugs and alcohol, substance behaviors, reactively clinging to others or other unhealthy relationship patterns. Um, self-harm, you know, it could, the, 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 there's a lot of different things that we're trying to do to resolve this state we're in, this neurological state of danger and lack of safety. And unfortunately, those things can, can propel and become even bigger, or not bigger problems, but just another problem um, associated with it all. 
So we, we want to teach people, and that's what Stacey will talk about here next, that the body can be used in ways to help heal trauma and anxiety and, and, and move back to, a, to that optimal place of um, parasympathetic activity of the va ventral vagus nerve, where we're using our brake again and we feel like we're drivers in control again um, of our lives. And this comes from Peter Levine as well. He was just talking about a client who, it was a trauma for her when she had to get a tonsillectomy when she was four years old and she didn't wanna do it, but all the doctors and nurses forced her down, held her down, required her to go through the process her brain went into hyperarousal and then hypoarousal and she was traumatized and her body wasn't working um, for a long time after that, for 20 years until he started, what he had her do was go rock climbing and, and had some other things associated with that. And when she looked down, uh, there was just a bunch of changes that occurred in her body and then in her mind that were part of the resolution to her trauma. And I think a big part of that is when you move your body, you're getting by at least, you know, I believe when that happens, well, we know this happens in the brain, you get bilateral stimulation. You're starting to pull back parts of the brain that have gone offline, whether it's the watchtower or whether it's the left side of the brain that can tell you that things are okay and you can approach again because you're safe now, that creates more balance and integration through bilateral stimulation. So whether it's movement or other ways, bilateral stimulation is critical. And that's what I think Stacy's gonna talk about. Yes, thank you so much. So, um, so in terms of, of bi bilateral stimulation, um, you know, it sounds like a very uh, technical thing, but the reality is that we all have years and years and years, an entire our entire lives, we've we've had experience with this. Um, so I'll just I'll just introduce myself really quickly. So I am a marriage and family therapist, also an EMDR therapist, and I um, also created a technology that integrates what's called tactile bilateral stimulation into the form of a wearable device that people can wear on the go, on the go to, to keep their brains calm in the here and now. Um, and so, you know, those, those of us that are familiar with EMDR um, will recognize the role that ta tactile bilateral stimulation plays in all of that. And at first I kind of thought that, um, well, I, I'll go really back into the history. So EMDR utilizes eye movements to process memories. Um, and they found that some people couldn't move their eyes. Um, maybe they had a TBI, maybe they were blind. There, there's some limitations. And so they started developing what's called tactile bilateral, bilateral stimulation. Where they would have somebody hold like this little pulser and it would just give them a nice soft vibration on each side of the body. And that's what they would use when they were doing some of the EMDR. Um, and so that, that's kind of where it became a thing, tact, like a, a technology driven tactile bilateral stimulation. That's the whole, camp that it's been um, developed from. And, and we've got tons of research on it now. It's been going you know, for 20 or 30 years at this point. And so we know pretty well what it does to the brain. But so when I was first developing this, I, I, at first I thought that tactile bilateral stimulation was an offshoot of EMDR, but then I actually realized that EMDR is an offshoot of bilateral stimulation. And that EMDR was just using what has been really genetically primed within every, every, every one of us. Um, to calm and soothe the body. So really bilateral stimulation is not just an offshoot or it, but AMDR doesn't just use bilateral stimulation. Bilateral stimulation is a much larger thing that, that is a part of all of us. So, oh, Spencer, do you want to, thank you. So one thing that, that happens for all of us when we're developed in the womb is that we are developed in the presence of a lot of bilateral stimulation. You know, one of the first things that we do for babies when they're born is we rock them to calm them down. But part of the reason why this works is because they've been rocked the whole time that they were developing. And so when, when we were in the womb, our mothers, when they walked around with us, we were, we were lulled and calmed to rest and, and sleep. And then when, we, when our mom sat down, that's typically when we activated, when we woke up, when we started kicking. And it's really frustrating when, when you're pregnant because you, it's hard to get any rest. Um, so really, I mean, our brains were developed in the presence of this, all of us. And, and that's why there's just a biological tendency for it to be calming and soothing. So whether or not it's in the form of being rocked or it's the form of hiking or walking or any other body movement, the reality is that right, left activation, right, left stimulation, right, left movement is calming to the brain. Um, let's go and do the next slide. So one thing that, ha so that hasn't changed, you know, that that's a part of all of us. Um, one thing that has changed though, is that it used to be an integral part of life. 
you used to have to move to live. We had to build a house, uh, grow our food, walk to school, walk to work, ride a horse. Uh, almost every part of your life involved movement. Like from the moment you woke up to the moment you went to bed, you were moving your body. Um, and so really, as we were dealing with life stresses, you know, we just found out that our garden is, you know, not growing or our heart, our house, our horse is sick or, you know, kind of like big stresses. We were also moving our bodies at the same time. And so, um, and, and that movement helps activate that right, right left parts of the brain gets things um, uh, systematically um, orchestrating with one another. But that's all been broken down. In, in, in really difficult ways that I don't think that we're all very super aware of. And, and that's one thing that we kind of wanted to highlight. So anyway, with this slide, it just talks a little bit about, yeah, we needed to be aware. Our primitive brain used to be aware of the tiger in the grass, but we were also meant to move away from it. And so what happens for a lot of us is there's a lot of tigers in our grass, but there's not a lot of movement away from it or, or movement in its presence. Can I comment on that, Stacy? Yeah. I think this speaks to Becca's point earlier that trauma maybe is what it is because either we can't move when this danger is happening or because the movement whether it be fighting or fleeing doesn't work right yeah. that's when the emergency brake gets pulled and um and and i just think it that's an interesting point to make when you say we live in a world now that it, it almost used to be that you had to move and so It'd be interesting to do a study. Maybe I don't want to say there was less trauma back then, but maybe because there was more movement in gen I don't know. Well, we know that there's more movement and we know that movement is good for the brain. So, I mean, there's a good chance that the brains were, were healthier for those reasons. We don't really know like all the other reasons, but yeah, absolutely. Let's go ahead and do the next slide. And so I'm just going to be a little bit faster because I, I know that we're kind of short on time. But um, so really what happens for all of us, and, and none of us is really exempt from this, even small children, small children. And the reality, think about it in the womb. If the mom's not walking around, is the child being rocked? You know, so our lack of movement is huge in terms of, it, is, of its impact on brain development. But in essence, we're not allowed to move. We have to sit in our car. We have to sit on the bus. We have to sit on the subway. And how much time do we spend in those spaces? And how much stress do we deal with in those stresses? And then we have to sit in school and sit in work and be on our phones and, and sit in this presentation. Like every, we are sitting all day long. People used to move their bodies for eight to 10 hours a day. And now we are sitting for eight to 10 hours. It, you know, really that's not that big of an exaggeration. Most of us sit for large periods of the day. So the reality is that most of the stress, the majority of the stress that we deal with is dealt within the body in the, in the absence of movement. And I really think that that's a huge piece of why we're seeing higher levels of symptomatology, because we know that when people are not allowed to move in the presence of their stress, they have higher symptom symptomatology. You know, whether or not that's a traumatic event or just even a stressful event moving the body is, is, is part of how the body deals with the stress. So we've taken out one of the, the greatest coping skills it has um, because it's, we're not allowed to use it. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So one of the things that I love is it's not just about, so there's two core factors here. So there's the role of the body and movement in managing stress. There's also the issue of time. The, mus the brain is a muscle. It gets really good at what it does a lot of. And so part, if you want to strengthen a part of the brain, it's got to spend a lot of time doing it. That's one of the limitations of therapy. We spend one hour a week with people, one hour. There's 168 hours in a week. What's happening in the other 167 hours? You know, or we get five hours of therapy with them or we, you know, whatever that is, it's like, okay, what's, what's really happening in all the gaps in between? Those gaps in, the tr in between are always going to be bigger than the spaces. And so in a lot of, in a lot of ways, um, I never thought I would be, I'm not that big into football. You know? <laughs> I'm like really protective of the brain concussion. It's just like, it kind of, it kind of scares me, but there's actually a lot that football has in common with trauma. Let's go ahead and do the next slide really quick. So um, one thing that is interesting about the similarities between um, football and trauma is, and therapy really, is that, okay, so you've got these players on the field, they've got this ball, right? That they're trying to move down the field. That's honestly what's kind of happening with trauma. They've got these triggers. 
and they're and, and we're trying to move them in our brains, move them through the space of where they need to go, where they are, and where we got to get them to. And sometimes that's that's all feel. Sometimes it can really feel like when you're dealing with trauma, it's like, oh, is that even possible? But that that trigger has to be held to be able to make it through. It's you're not going to just throw that out there in the field and have it get where you want it to go. It's got to have a vessel to go from point A to point B. And honestly, that vessel is the body. Look how closely he's holding that little ball. Look how he's protecting, you know, okay, I'm gonna, my body, with my body, I'm gonna move away from this and I'm gonna move towards this all the while holding this in my arm, getting it from point B to point A to point B. That's really, when we're asking people to heal from their trauma and change their brains, that's what we're asking them to do. But how calm is that body? You know, I mean, the movement of that trigger through the brain system is dependent on how calm it is. Because like we said, sometimes things shut down. It can't move. It can't go. It can't change place. It can't be stored differently if it can't move. And so one thing that I think is interesting about therapy, you know, we have these weekly sessions or however often we have them. And we think that that's where, and, and, and with, with different forms of therapy, it moves it in different ways. But traditional talk therapy, I kind of conceptualize it as being the huddle. Okay, this is our strategy. This is, this is what we're gonna do. But it's not the play. You know, the, the therapy room is not indicative of what life is like. There's no kids screaming at you. You didn't just smell someone that smelled just like your perpetrator. You know, you, you're not having all these flashes. Um, and so being able to keep it calm in those moments, that's the play. That's where the ball's actually moved. Therapy is often how we talk about moving it, but it's not how it's actually moved because it's gotta be activated. It's mm -hmm. gotta, it's, it's gotta be activated to get moved. And so that's, let's go ahead you and do the next move, Sorry. Yeah, no, no, that's good, yeah. And so that's why the, that's why the idea of, of how we need to support people and, and how they move those memories is, is so essential because they, they need real-time support. They need support in the day in, day out, and especially right in the moment when they're getting triggered. So we need to be teaching our people how to do this. Do they really know how to calm their bodies down? Do they recognize when it is being calm? Because when you're used to that, that break being super strong, you learn to not be aware of what's going on with your body because you can't control it anyway. So it, it, it's a part of being aware of your body. Are you aware of when it's, you know, when when you're grounded and when you're not. Sometimes people aren't even aware of that piece. And then when you are aware, are you able to kind of calm that down in real time? So one thing that's really interesting also about memory reconsolidation is that it goes on all the time. This is not something that we just do as therapists. The brain is always reconsolidating our memories. And um, it's not just changing the facts. It, it's not changing the facts of what happened. It's changing the feel, the tone, the, the lens through which it's through which is created. And so what happens is that when a trauma memory comes up or any memory really, the, what the brain does is it brings up the past, sinks it in with the present and then restores it. it. It stores it back with those two being linked. And so being able to calm the brain in real time is essential to being able to work through trauma. Um, and because the window of reconsolidation is about 30 to 60 minutes, and it's not going to wait for the next therapy session. We don't get to enter in that space. This is this, this clients are on their own in these moments, and we might not even know what's happening, and no one around them may even know because they get really good at masking it. So let's go ahead and go into the next slide. And so um, really what, what trauma, working through trauma memories is all about is bringing that trauma and weaving it into calm and safety, using the body as your greatest protector of, uh, to, to give that enhancement of that sense of calm and safety. And so um, we, we really need to be able to, to teach our people how to use the condition of their body, again, because they have to utilize their other senses in order to avoid getting hijacked by the visual images or the other types of senses that are, that are so prominent and vivid um, from the trauma memory. Okay, go ahead and do the next slide. And so that's why I mean, one thing, and we only have just a few minutes left, but the one thing that's really essential is helping teaching people. There's, I kind of have, this is kind of my own terminology, but there's the difference between active bilateral stimulation and passive bilateral stimulation. So I view active bilateral stimulation as any real movement of the body. Um, you know, people used to do this 
a lot of the day, six to eight hours a day. Um, so any type of movement, you know, uh, knitting, running, throwing, like but almost any movement is going to have a little piece to it. And then in terms of the passive piece, when now we've got all these, these big blocks of time when we're not allowed to use our bodies. That's where I kind of think some of this technology comes into play. So you can be having this right, left activation when you can't be moving your body because you're, you're simply not allowed to. And again, we, we know that's essential because your body deals with stress as it moves through it in real time, not just in the therapy office, but in all those spaces in between. I think we just have one, that one slide left. So we know that that tactile bilateral stimulation is effective. So the tactile is more of the technology. So these, these, these wearables that have this right left stimulation that helps, um, helps calm the brain. And so this is just some of the stuff that we found through independent researchers, you know, all throughout, you know, different parts of the world and in different times um, have kind of looked at this and consistently found that it's helpful to the brain. And then go ahead and do the next slide. So we really see, you know, that tactile stimulation bilateral can, can be seen as a support tool to mental health treatment because of the limitations of really being able to be in the moments when the plays are actually happening. You know, we, we're, we're in the huddle, but we're not in the play most of the time as therapists. And then one more. And so that's, that's kind of the role that BrainScope plays. That's just one of the technologies that are out there. So, um, and, and if you guys are interested in finding out more about BrainScope, there's the website there. But so our whole goal is actually two different things. One, to enhance calm through our technologies. And the second is we have kind of these ongoing podcasts, psychoeducation, that's all about knowing how to enhance connection and growing attachment in our lives because the fight or flight response really cuts off attachment, really cuts off connection. And so we, we talk a little bit about how do you re-engage that? How do you continue to grow that? And then one last slide. And then those are the other, um, the, the three different uh, technologies that are currently on the market that engage this right left um, stimulation are my company BrainScoped and then also TouchPoints Solution and BiTap. And I just wanted to make sure that you guys are aware of all the different technologies that are out there. I mean, that's actually really impossible to say. Like I, there's so much technology that is always innovating, but, but of the, the established wearables right now that engage bilateral, those, those are the three that are out there. So anyway, that it's been so fun to have this time with you guys. Thank you so much. I've really, really valued that. Um, Becca, do you have any other last thoughts? No, I think, I think it's so important. I think these are all good things to talk about and to conceptualize. I'm excited for us to continue our conversation um, further about how this, how this gets integrated for people, what some of the more developing research that, that you guys are a part of um, and, and what that means and how as providers and as therapists and people who are really just looking for how do we be there in the play? I love that analogy, how we can help our clients do that and um, help their brain grow and develop in a way that that removes some of that log jam of, of life and the absence of movement. Awesome. Thanks, Becca. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both. All right, Enjoy thank these. you guys. Thank you.